You always make me say the crazy stuff, right? Thanks. Love you. Sorry if you can hear my cat in the background. She's in the house and she's not happy right now. Okay, relax. I know there are bugs crawling in my pants. I'm sure of it. Anything for the Lord, amen? <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Talks with Tally, my podcast slash segment on my channel, Time with Tally, where I speak about the Lord, I speak about my faith, I have faith talks with you all. Today, I'm very, very excited because, of course, again, I'm going to share a word that the Lord has placed on my heart that I feel was very very personal to me and it definitely of course anytime the lord gives you a word it's usually because you need to hear it first and then others have to hear it so let's just begin by praying and then we can introduce the theme of the word today father god i want to say thank you so much for the opportunity lord god as your daughter to come before you lord and be able to spend some time with you lord god again in this moment lord god i want to say thank you for every single person that is actually looking through that screen right now and watching this video lord god i ask that you bless their life lord and that today if there is a word here for them lord god that you Give them an individual revelation of what it is that you want to speak to them today, Lord. Let it be you, Father God, put a filter through and in front of my mouth, Lord God, so it only be your Holy Spirit speaking in this place and in this moment, Father God. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. Oh my gosh. Okay, so let's get into it, y'all. So for today's theme, the Lord has given me the topic. It's titled, Lest We Judge Ourselves. Ooh, ooh, be careful. <laughs> this is episode three of Talks with Tally, and I'm just, I'm very excited. This one, it's, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna begin with a quick testimony. So I have a book here that is very, very special to me. In this book, I know basically all of my very supernatural, very special um, testimonies and or encounters with God. And this is what I want to talk to you about today because I feel like maybe somebody's going through the same thing. So this is from June 8th. I wrote, it's kind of also like a journal, I would say, this thing, like journal entries kind of. So it says, I've recently felt a disconnect from my first love of God, like the last like three days or so. And usually, as many of you know, when you first come to Christ and you first reconcile your life with Christ, it's just you're just so on fire and you're just so excited and there's all this love and you're just like, and this is like the more common theme, of course. Some people it may not be that way, but I know for me it was. And I just, I was so on fire for like a few months there. And then out of nowhere, I just kind of felt like this disconnect. And I was like, what happened? And I was really, really upset because I'm like, Lord, I used to feel you every single day. I used to feel your presence. What happened? Like, where did you go? Even though obviously I know that he didn't go anywhere in my head, logically speaking, but spiritually there was something off, right? Things don't feel as high energy and exciting and on fire. And I feel like I don't, feel his spirit as I did before. Lately, I've been asking for refinement and maturity and peace and, and molding from my potter. So this is where the disconnect occurred. I was at work. I basically ended up getting very comfortable around the people that I'm working with now. I'm at a new job. And so I was just getting accustomed and, you know, trying to, I guess, fit in to just what their schedule is, how they work and things like that, get to know the people on the shift and, and whatnot. So I had been a little bit anxious about that. I'm not going to lie. And then there came one of the days that I actually started to feel a bit more comfortable with people. I started to make jokes and whatnot. And then it slipped out of my mouth, a dirty joke in response to what someone had said. And I got to be honest, my default setting was making dirty jokes that used to be who I was. That's like, my mind was never really clean, to be honest. But as you guys know, of course, my mouth was very dirty, but so was my mind. It was just, that's that's who I was. It's not like I sat there and I thought about it first before I said it, it just blurted out, it came out. And I was just like, where the heck did that come from? I didn't even think about it. I, I didn't think about it twice. It just happened impulsively out of nowhere. It says, I made a dirty joke the other day and I felt ashamed. Cause right after that, the Holy Spirit convicted me and was like, would a woman of God be making these jokes? Would she be speaking in this way? And I'm not gonna lie, I felt so much shame. It was terrible. <laughs> it was horrible. It was really a bad feeling. And not because he made me feel that way, but because I definitely, I started to rain down lots of grief upon myself. 
Up until that point, I had a huge, huge fear, especially because I was so on fire for God. I had this huge fear and like this anxiety and this panic regarding me disappointing God. Like I was so fearful of disappointing and disappointing God and sinning that I was literally like so careful and cautious with every single step. And then the Lord kept reminding me, you know, you're never going to be fully sinless. You're going to probably keep messing up. He kept reminding me through people and through that act that there's a reason he saved me. I'm in perfect and that's exactly why I need him. I asked God in return to also rip me from the things that were stopping me from maturing and getting closer to him. So for three days I didn't feel that you know that fear that anxiety and I thought maybe the Lord turned his back on me or at least that's what the enemy probably wanted me to think right because of that one bad thing that I did three days prior that I repented for and I prayed about and I asked God for forgiveness for. To be honest, in that moment, I actually was just secluding myself. I secluded myself from him in shame. I was still allowing myself to feel unworthy of his forgiveness. But in that time, I kept praying and I kept reading and I kept fasting and I just kept going even though spiritually I wasn't feeling like that energy was there for me. When in reality, I was the one that was not letting him in and I was blocking him in his presence from coming in because I chose to feel guilt and shame. Then there came a day where I'm literally not even kidding. I was on the toilet. That sounds gross, whatever, but I'm very real on this channel as I will always be. <laughs> I had literally just finished praying and I was crying and I was Lord. I was just like, I just, I don't understand. And then he finally shut me up and was like, spoke to me in my ear and said, which one of these two things makes more sense? That I forgave you that night that you decided to ask for forgiveness and you prayed about it and you cried to me about it. That I forgave you or does it actually make more sense? <laughs> <laughs> that you've condemned yourself and maintained yourself as a victim. Okay, first of all, Lord, <laughs> you did not have to call me out like that, you know? All I'm saying is you did not have to call me out like that. <laughs> when I say I stopped crying immediately, <laughs> It was just, it's like a little slap. It's like, hello, get it together. Are you really gonna let the enemy lie to you and make you believe that I haven't forgiven you because you truly meant it from the heart when you said, I'm so sorry? Are you really gonna let him make you believe that? Even though my word says otherwise, even though my love for you says otherwise. What I want you to take from this is the fact that there are times where we will make our punishment for the things that we have done more severe than he will or than, him, than he has. I did not allow myself to feel better. That's what it was. I didn't wanna pray, I didn't wanna read the Bible, but I still did it anyways because I knew at least logically that my feelings were lying to me, that the thoughts in my head that the enemy was trying to attack me with were a lie. Thank God for logic sometimes, you know? So therefore me condemning myself was exactly what the enemy wanted me to do. And I let it last for three days. But God said on the third day, ooh, shut up, I'll rise again, wow. Thank you, Lord. The way I let that shame eat me up was something crazy. I genuinely felt like, oh my gosh, God has worked in me such, in such a dramatic, majestic, magical, miraculous way that I felt like in that moment with that one second, I felt like I literally backtracked a billion steps. But I wanna remind you guys that that is exactly what comes from the religious mindset. The goal, of course, is not to intentionally sin. Sitting here debating on whether or not to do something and then doing it anyways, even though you know that the Lord wouldn't be a fan of it. But in that moment, I know that I learned that I have to accept the fact that I will sin again. And there will come a point where I'll probably disappoint my father again. And there's some times when we probably sin and we don't even know it. We don't even realize it. I'm gonna bring you guys to Acts chapter 13, verse 46 to 47. Let's read it together. I have the New International Version of the Bible, by the way. It says, then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. In here, Paul and Barnabas, followers of Jesus Christ, were preaching to some Jews. Well, they were preaching to a crowd, some Jews were around and they got upset. Basically what Paul is saying here is, we offered you something and you don't want it because it's not your way. But then you also get mad when we're moving on from you because we're not gonna change the word that we have spread for you and for your comfortability. So now that we're moving on, you're still gonna also get mad? What I want us to focus on is the fact that he says, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. Now, knowing Paul, this is likely some type of sarcasm. <laughs> I feel like that's definitely him just calling them out because the Jews knew of the Messiah. The Jews knew of them having a savior that was coming to save their people and free them. But now when they hear the good news that 
he's here, you don't want to believe it. It's got to be something to do with the fact that you don't feel like you actually deserve eternal life when it's presented right in front of you. How many times do we be in our own way when it comes to the things that God wants to do with us? Like Jesus came to the Jews originally, first and foremost, but they rejected him. And so then what happens? He then now spreads his word, well, his disciples spread his word also across all people, including the Romans and the Gentiles, which were basically the people that he didn't originally come here to save. So now because his own people rejected him, now we all get the chance. And by making this choice, the Jews basically said, my judgment of myself, I'm going to put it above what God has said. I'm going to put it above how he has judged me. God's word tells us again and again that he loves us so much. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. He loves you and he's more than willing to accept you. The question is, are you going to accept him? Because if you're going to be around here believing the lies of the enemy, that you're not good enough for his love and for all the good things that he's offering, well, that's on you. The enemy wants us to live in unforgiveness, not just in a state of us being unforgiving of others, but one, not being forgiven by the Father, and also wants us to sit in unforgiveness of ourselves. And that's why this word has been titled by the Holy Spirit, lest we judge ourselves. This is a reminder for you to stop overthinking and stop over judging yourself. Remember, that's not your job to bring judgment upon yourself in that way. Is there such thing as righteous judgment and you're supposed to be examining yourself? Absolutely. But it takes common sense to understand what I'm trying to say here. Stop overdoing it because it's going to inhibit your relationship with the Lord. And this goes even for new people that they don't want to come to Jesus unless they're sinless first. They think that they'll be more acceptable to be forgiven in the eyes of the Lord if they have less sin at least to bring to him. Y'all, once you got a record, you got a record. I promise you it's unnecessary to do all this before you come to him because nothing that you do could ever be good enough to erase the debt of your sin. And we've all done it. And that's exactly why he went and died on that cross for us because we can't do anything ourselves in order to erase that debt. And it's true. It's true what's said. You wouldn't get clean before taking a shower. <laughs> right? He is your shower. I mean, why else do you go to the doctor? Because you have something that needs to be healed. And it's because your current state cannot be helped on its own. A lot of people have this fear about coming to the feet of Christ because of either something that they were taught previously, or maybe their own thoughts and their own fears and feelings have stopped them. Like, I have to do this in order to be a believer. I need to do this. You're overwhelming yourself. <laughs> I need to tell you guys about a God that does some crazy stuff. Hold on. I need you to understand that the God that we serve is a God that can rip the taste of stuff out of your mouth. When I say rip the taste of stuff out of your mouth, I mean he can genuinely, from your core, rip out those desires of ungodly things if you ask him to, if you're open to it. Those overwhelming cravings, right, to get or do certain things that, you know, will lead you to sin and do all these other evil things that are not of the Lord. He can literally take those feelings away from you. The desire. Flesh is disgusting. And I'm still praying for the day that my spirit can be ripped from my flesh because it causes me to sin. I don't want to keep doing that. I don't want to keep disappointing the Father. We have a saying in Puerto Rico that it's like, show me who you walk with and I'll show you who you are. And although this doesn't apply to God, I'm one of those people that I like to make sure that my friends look good and I don't make them look bad. I'm, I don't embarrass them or the, my family or my mother. I guess I just want to be a child that he's proud of. So that's what I mean by that. As I said, this word is a reminder to not judge yourself so harshly that you perseverate on your sin. So much to the point that it actually causes you to turn from God out of fear. And there also may be even some that say, you know what, I actually would rather just continue to live in sin because I've heard it be said to me, to my face. Well, let me tell you, as a friend, as someone that cares about you, as a sister in Christ, one is killing you, my man, my girl, whoever. But I get it because I did it too, like a billion times, times a billion. But I do encourage you that if there's ever that little seedling inside of you that is saying, you know, I don't really want to do this anymore. It never results in anything good. It always actually ends up turning out to be for my bad. That no matter how many times I try to fill this void, it actually never actually gets filled. If you want to be free from that, and see who God really is, I promise you, if you ask him, he will deliver you from all those desires. I was brought to the verse um, in Luke chapter 18, verse 17. It says, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. This is a reminder that it's up to you to receive your inheritance. We are his children and we're giving this, we're given this gift of the kingdom. Are you gonna give your house and your prized possessions to a stranger that you don't even know? You don't know their heart, their intentions? The thing is, if we know him, we can know ourselves. If we know him, we will always know who he is in the midst of us judging ourselves. If we know him, we know his word, we can withstand all the lies. Now, I'm not saying go on to the opposite end of this and deem yourself as having this right to the kingdom and this inheritance and become prideful. We shouldn't be having this entitlement to the kingdom. Because trust me, none of us have a VIP pass to the kingdom of God. It even says it in his word. Nobody is better than the other. He has no favoritism. There's no favoritism in God. It says it in Romans. I forget what chapter, but maybe I'll put it in the description. <laughs> this also means 
be like his child, act like his child would. It's not just the mind of the child, it's this blind faith, this Delulu faith, this love for him. And in that way, he will give you what you are meant to receive in the first place. Children have these really pure hearts. They're not tainted in the desires of doing all kinds of evil things, not just naturally at least. So if you're truly looking to God for his will and just because you love him, and just because you choose to, that's where he looks. That's what he wants, the posture of your heart. And he knows your heart. So stop judging yourself so harshly. Don't you think that babies also have a few mess ups in their first attempts of walking? We are his children. We are his babies. <laughs> And then remember, on top of that, the older that we get, the clumsier we get, the more we fall. It's cyclical. We are built to fall. But I have someone that's always going to catch me. His way is never going to be easy. So therefore, your steps will not be. You think carrying a cross is easy? Symbolically, when he went onto that cross and he died for us, our old selves died as well. So we died with him. I mean, if you think about it, it's solid, pure wood, right? At the time, they didn't have the tools that we did. And there were three different types of crosses. Those that had cross beams were like another 70 to 90 pounds. No wonder that man, Simeon, had to help him because just imagine getting whipped and beaten and spit on lashed with all this blood and pain breaks my heart and i'm getting angry <laughs> but imagine going through that and then having to carry all that across the city i'm so y'all all i'm saying is it's so true what they say the lord knew what he was doing when he picked his disciples because i would peter everybody i'm not joking i'm, I'm just saying just even thinking about that now i get so angry <laughs> I get angry. It's just a reminder that nobody said that this path was going to be easy, ever. Actually, it says that there will be suffering and you will likely mess up a lot. And that's the way to follow. It says it in his word, Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 24, it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Deny your own feelings about yourself. When you feel worthless, when you feel like you have no self-esteem, when you feel unloved, when you feel like you're nobody, deny yourself and deny all those desires that you have to do things that are ungodly. Follow his footsteps, follow what he did follow his character as much as you can. You're not expected to be him, but you're expected to be like him. Just a little bit of biblical context. Wood in Genesis signifies sin, which on the cross his blood washed over. He carried our sins with him to death. The same way that, wow Lord, thank you. The same way, remember I said that when he died, we died with him. Our old selves died with him. The same way that we have to take that same path, we need to carry our sins to the cross. We need to carry our sins with us to bring to him so he can wash over them. Wow. I'll cry right now, Lord. Stop, please. In Exodus, wood definitely is shown um, at times to signify miracles and also a uh, communion with God, which in this moment, that's exactly what happened. If you think about it, the Lord in that moment literally was having a communion between the son and the father. There's a communion happening right as our sins were getting washed. There's a miracle happening. God is crazy. God is so amazing. <laughs> I touched on the topic of righteous judgment and I'm gonna discuss that with you now because I need you to understand that the type of judgment I'm talking about right now that you shouldn't be doing, lest, in case I didn't say it before, lest signifies with the intention of preventing to avoid the risk of. So this word says, lest we judge ourselves. That's what it's titled. Avoid the risk of judging yourself. It's basically a warning of the possibility that something bad can occur if you do so. Everything has its time and there's a way to do certain things. I'm gonna bring you to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 to 32. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup for whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you and many have fallen asleep. If we were propped Properly judging ourselves we would not be judged but then we are judged by the Lord but when we are judged by the Lord sorry we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world this verse is also telling us to properly judge ourselves there's a way to do this it doesn't mean that you don't do it there's a way to not do it too especially not in a way that's gonna draw you farther from him it just doesn't make any sense and when you get to know him you know that that's not what he would want he wouldn't want you shaming yourself he wouldn't want you pushing yourself away from him he wouldn't want to feel distance from you he wouldn't want you to turn your face away from him because of just something that you feel about yourself. Have you ever heard a friend of yours, someone that you care about deeply, talk about themselves in a manner that it hurts you because of how much you love them? You hear them talk bad about themselves, how they don't want to live anymore, how they aren't good enough, that how they aren't made to do certain things, that this world doesn't need them. Could you imagine how he feels when we say those things about ourselves and he created us? Do you know how much that would hurt? So this is just my advice as a sister in Christ, try not to hurt God's feelings. His creation was fearfully and wonderfully made and he loves you in a way that words cannot describe that humans could ever feel. Thank you, Lord. In this verse, I want to break it down a little bit. It says, examine ourselves yes the bread is his body his 
sacrifice for our sins. His body is the sacrifice for our sins. And drink from the cup means purpose. Cups are usually significant of some type of a purpose or a vessel, right? Which is like a plan for your life. So whoever doesn't recognize the body or recognize the sacrifice that he made for us, you're putting yourself in a placement, in a position to bring judgment upon yourself not from you but from god this is why i say it's so important to have a relationship with him and know him because that way you know what he actually would want you would know that when he sends you a certain type of message even if it's not as clear as we want to hear it you would know what he's trying to tell you when he's giving you the green light when he's giving you the red light wow thank you lord i remember there came a point where the lord had given me many words themes topics um to share with the YouTube channel and I was holding on to them I've been holding on to them for months and then there came a point where I was like God I don't know I feel like you want me to release this but if it's not your time then don't let it be your time Lord God give me some type of um give me a word when it is time I'm not moving until you tell me to I'm not opening my mouth until you tell me to until one day I sat down with my pastor and I talked to her about it and she called me out <laughs> she was like this is religious mindset why do you need to hear God say go when he literally has given you the word already He's given you the tools. He's already given you the resources. He's literally carved out the entire plan for you in front of your face. And yet you still say, well, I don't think he wants me to move yet. Ma'am, he literally gave you the house with the key. You just have to walk in. <laughs> That's me talking to myself. <laughs> if you continue to judge yourself so harshly in a way that goes against the things that he would want, in turn, you're also indirectly showing your belief and faith in him and what he's done and what he has said. It's not a lie when I say that the guilty usually tell on themselves first. And without you even knowing, you're actually kind of showing exactly why you need judgment in the first place. And this is because you are continually condemning yourself and punishing yourself when he has forgiven you a long time ago. Why are we wasting time still talking about the things that you've done and the sins you've committed. I forgave him a long time ago. I forgot him already. I don't even know what you're talking about. He doesn't even know what you're talking about. When the verse says sick and ill, I need you to understand that it obviously also means spiritually. It means unhealthy. It means unclean. Unclean thoughts unclean practices. It says many have fallen asleep. Therefore, many no longer have this relationship with God. It has become ritualistic. You pray just to pray. You read just to read. But there's no revelation. There's no relationship. There's no energy. There's no depth to it anymore. There's no connection. Your relationship with God should not be a pile of tasks. Lord, you always make me say the crazy stuff, right? Thanks. Love you. Imagine being in a relationship that's dull and paralyzed. That's exactly what happens when we sleep. When we sleep, there's this thing that occurs. It's called paralysis to protect you from moving in your sleep, to protect you from hurting yourself. And so you don't like fall out of the bed, but that's exactly what happens when we sleep. We lose consciousness, alertness. We're walking zombies at that point. Your body goes into a paralysis while you dream and sleep so you don't hurt yourself. So while creating this dull and paralyzed relationship with God, where it says many are asleep, by you condemning yourself, by you judging yourself, by you punishing yourself more than he already has, you're paralyzing your relationship with him in order to protect yourself because you think you're doing the right thing by punishing yourself because you deserve it. And in reality, what you're doing is barricading him off, not letting him in. Wow, God. Speak, Lord, speak. I want you to obviously notice how it says properly judge yourself. It doesn't mean that you don't judge yourself at all, but there's a right way to do it. This means that you should be. You need to stop overthinking. Always turn to God for it for his truth, for through his scripture, through his word, and also stop cultivating. And this is something I did. That's why I'm telling you right now, if you're out there and you're doing exactly what I did, we need, the Lord and I also need you to stop cultivating an environment for fear, for it to grow and fester. You have to stop being so scared to mess up again. And remember that his judgment is for the wicked, but his discipline and his correction is all for your edification. Of course, it doesn't mean that you freely sin after you know him and you have a relationship with him and accept him in your heart. Because of course, where he is, there, there has to be change. But just know that he knows you're gonna mess up. Don't take advantage of his grace and his mercy. Yet also, you gotta take it easy on yourself. Hebrews 4.16 says, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. It doesn't say that if there will be a time of need, there will be. So what I need you to understand is if you truly believe in him and everything that he has done, when you mess up, you need to come to him boldly and say, God, I messed up again, for real, this time. I really did. I messed up again. Of course, I didn't want to, but I made a mistake. Help me fix me. Please be the one to fix me, actually, because everything I try obviously doesn't work. Examine means to inspect in detail, to determine nature or condition, to investigate thoroughly. Secondly, it also signifies testing the knowledge or proficiency of someone by requiring them to answer questions or perform tasks. I don't know about y'all, but when I was in school, in nursing school, 
I wanted to know what questions I got wrong. Therefore, I can focus on what are my weakest points? Where can I grow? Where can I strengthen? So I think you have to also ask God, maybe. Maybe that'll help. Ask him, where are my weak points? What are the things that I'm not seeing? Where are my trigger points? What am I missing? What am I lacking? Reveal to me the sins that I'm committing without even knowing, Lord. Because the best thing about him is that he can strengthen you through him in your walk with him. And as a big sister, I just want to remind you that you pass a test also on what you get right, not just what you get wrong. So stop focusing on that so much and just focus on him instead. The rest will come from him in time. I think a lot of the times as humans, when we focus so much on our sin, it actually takes away our focus from God. And actually, the more we focus on something, that's the way that we go. When I was in my class to get my motorcycle license, because I do have my motorcycle license, vroom, vroom, um, <laughs> They kept reiterating this saying that was a really, really good teaching that I feel like will be able to help you in this area. They said, you need to turn your head where you want to go, not where you're going. So if you see a stumbling block or you see a pothole or if you see something in front of you that's going to have you mess up, if you focus on where you are headed right now, too much. It will not allow you to get to where you need to go. You need to turn your head towards where you're going, not where you've been placed. Woo! I also feel like in general, this is something that I have to address because I want to just add really quickly at the end here. I'm almost done. I feel like this just this word in general is just about judgment overall when it comes to the topic of us within ourselves, with our relationship with him, with each other. Righteous judgment is also not just for ourselves. Righteous judgment is making judgments in accordance to his word and what he would want, right? But the way I think of it, it's it's all based in love. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. There's this very, very popular verse that a lot of people know. And I'm going to read it to you. It's Matthew 7, 1. And it says, do not judge so you won't be judged. For you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others. And you will be measured by the same measure you use. Now, what if we use righteous judgment? In the way he told us to. Hello? <laughs> then we will also be judged by righteousness. What this verse is telling us, and I think a lot of people tend to miss it, is that we must not judge others and bestow upon others the judgment of God, God's judgment. Because then you're making yourself like God when you are clearly not. Jesus said this in John 7, 24. It says, stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. Judgment is necessary. That's what helps us scale where we are and where we need to grow, where we need to strengthen, where we are okay. But the best thing is, is that his judgment, his correction always is for our good. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 5. I love to, I like putting in a lot of word <laughs> when it comes to the words that the lord has given me i love to back it up with scripture because that's where the truth is right not not to manipulate the word to condemn anybody but to beef up i guess the word that's being given the biggest thing to know is that a lot of things in the word are repeated more than once and in different ways so if you can't find it in one area you're going to find it in another but his messages are always pretty clear and consistent very consistent sometimes a little unclear <laughs> That's where you ask for revelation from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but the verse says, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 3 to 5, it says, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Whew. That, that verse right there basically, literally, basically wraps everything up. <laughs> when I first converted and uh, reconciled my life with Christ, I had a friend comment on a Facebook post that I posted. I shared a video um, that somebody had made on my timeline, and it was talking about how crystals and chakras and tarot cards and um, psychic mediums and things like that, that they were not God. So I shared it because that is my belief. I came from believing in those things and I was definitely mistaken personally. That was my encounter with the Lord that has definitely debunked that belief. My friend ended up commenting on the post and she was like, my friend, please read Matthew 7, 1. I read Matthew 7, 1, but I've also read the word where it says, serve the Lord your God only. Serve the Lord your God and only him. Have no other gods before me. And so I think the scripture is very clear there. The scripture is also very, very clear when it comes to judging others. The scripture is clear in a lot of things. And I want to make it very, very clear. I was not judging and I have no problem taking accountability when it's time for me to take accountability if I've done something wrong? Absolutely, 100%. Does it suck? Absolutely, but I'm going to. I, in that moment, was just sharing a truth that I discovered and that many have as well. And that's the truth of Jesus Christ. That video was really just saying that all the things that I believed were God at one point were not God. But the video never stated anything about, you know, condemning other people that believe 
that that is God. It's just that is what I have found to be true. So my response was, you know, I don't I don't personally believe in that. I don't personally believe in inanimate in objects being gods that, you know, they don't give life. They're man-made. They're just idols, not God. No, I know some of you understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so I think this is something that's going on a lot nowadays where, and this is, I always responded with love with her. I love her and she is a beautiful soul. I love her very, very much. This is not coming at that person whatsoever. This is just obviously a moment in time where two different beliefs collided and clashed. Agree to disagree. That's fine with me. <laughs> but I also want to remind you that unfortunately, a lot of times in society people base their feelings you know on being the stem the the root the basis for truth right but i have to say this and this is gonna sound like i'm being spicy but i'm not trying to be i'm gonna say but i'm gonna I'm say it i'm gonna just i'm gonna rip off the band-aid okay just because you feel attacked or judged it doesn't mean that that's actually what's happening that's just your feeling and sometimes we take some things upon ourselves because there's something inside of us that we already question or we're maybe unsure of. So when our sense of stability and security is being messed with or getting attacked, we can get defensive. And I know that because not for nothing, God is that for me. I get offended when people talk about God a certain type of way, not because I'm not sure about what I believe in, because everything that I have seen and the evidence I have seen have shown me that God is very, very real. Nothing in this world can be proved like that. I can't prove that I'm sitting here and having this conversation with you right now. We can't prove that you're actually hearing my voice. We can't prove that the tree behind me is a tree or a bush or maybe a vine. I don't freaking know. You see what I'm saying? To prove something is to prove and to show that it cannot be another way. So I can't prove that God is real, but the evidence is showing me. There's a high likelihood that that's the case. My experiences have shown me that that's very much the case. Very much the case. My experiences have shown me that he is undeniable. He is unshakable. And when you really encounter God for real, there's no going back. And I know some people know what I'm talking about. So when we have that sense of security and stability being attacked, we also get protective. The things that we love, we protect, right? But in this world, we do have to understand that other people may not carry the same beliefs as us. That maybe the other person doesn't even understand where you're coming from because they haven't had that same experience as you. And in this instance, actually, I came exactly from that. I believed exactly what she believed, but I got out of it. I found the one real thing that has really shown me real life and has shown me consistency, has shown me evidence of everything that he has said with no contradiction. So that's why I spoke on it in the first place. I was delivered from that and I've been there and I've done that. That doesn't make me better than anybody. It just means that I'm free from it. And some people don't see that as something to be liberated from. That's fine. It was something that I needed to be freed from in order to see and meet the real God. So in that case, you know, I speak from experience, not unknowing. I want you to think of righteous judgment like discernment, but with love as the base, kind of like a cake. You have love, concern, protection, and then righteous judgment and redirection of action is sprinkled on top. <laughs> Maybe that's a lot, but that's kind of how I see it. When a brother or sister in Christ provides you a call of judgment, they should be presenting it with love. They should be presenting it with some concern for your betterment, for your edification. You know, hey, I'm concerned for you. Hey, I haven't seen you at church. I haven't, you know, I haven't heard from you. I've been praying for you. Let's pray together. Let's get together. How you doing? I've noticed this. Do you want to talk about something? The same way that I'm an older sister or a sister in general or a friend, that's the same way I am with my brothers and sisters in Christ. When you see them go down a self-destructive path and you want to provide that Christ-like love to guide them and protect them and just check in and make sure that they're all right, it's never to condemn. Condemning them, condemning ourselves, it's it's all straight from the enemy. Correction is from God. So therefore, if someone comes to you with righteous judgment and they come to you with the principles of righteousness and the word of God, and it's not based on our own personal feelings of how we feel someone should have a relationship with the Lord and how they should present themselves and blah, 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 blah. If it's based on the encouragement and drawing you nearer to God, drawing you closer to him, it's, it's from the Lord. They're working in the way the Lord is guiding them. God has put us on this earth to also help each other to maintain our gaze and our focus on Jesus and what he's done for us. Remember, you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. We can do all things through him. I'm gonna leave you with this. The best thing about being imperfect is that we are not expected to be the opposite. Imagine being God and having to judge who he loves because they choose to not follow you or love you or your direction. I'm very glad that I don't have to be the one that calls the shots. The hardest job is on God and he's the only one that can do it and that's to judge. So liberate yourself from that burden. Draw closer to him and ask him to restore your faith and to restore your relationship. All right, y'all. 
Let's pray. Father God in heaven, I just want to come to you, Lord God, in this moment and say thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord God, to be able to share this word that you have given me and placed on my heart, Lord God. I want to say thank you so much, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you have made for us, Lord God. Thank you so much for being who you are, who you said that you are. You have forgiven us. You've forgiven our trespasses, our sins, Lord God, that we no longer have to judge ourselves and punish ourselves anymore to keep ourselves in this cage limiting us from you hiding us away from you closing ourselves off from a relationship with you lord god let us always know that you are always with us and let us always know that the hardest job is one that you have thank you lord god for this revelation and this word that you've given us today and in jesus name i pray that everybody that's watching this video today lord god be blessed with an encounter with you one that is undeniable and unshakable let them know who you really are lord in jesus name i pray amen amen i know that was kind of a long one and i feel like every single time i record these videos for the glory of god i feel like <laughs> it never stays you know how you write it it never stays one way it's, it, glory to god let god be the one that speaks let the holy spirit be the one that's convicting and revealing and doing what he got to do for each one of you thank you all so much for spending time with me today i really do appreciate it god bless you all and i will see you guys in the next episode episode four that one i'm not gonna lie that one's tough i will see y'all in the next one i love you bye